we worship this morning.
it is good to see everybody. We noticed that the left side sat down quicker than the right side, so. <laughs> we see where our extroverts are sitting this morning. <laughs> Good to see everybody today. It's a pretty day. It's, it's been a good weekend, and it's so nice to see everybody here today. Uh, looks like we have a packed house already. So um, if you have any extra seats, I think we have a couple, like nowhere. Um, that's about it, <laughs> right? No. Oh we, have, oh, we have the very front row in the splash zone right over here. <laughs> so, uh... <laughs> So, uh, uh, well, it's good to see everybody today. It's a few, uh, uh, just a quick announcements. Again, uh, the majority of announcements you have as far as what, we have a lot going on all, all the time. Uh, most of it's in the bulletin. Some, there's also things that are going on uh, that are not uh, always in the bulletin. Uh, but on the back, it has a, a kind of a list of the different studies that we have going on. We have some different Bible studies going on throughout the week. We have a Bible study this afternoon that goes on. And all of these are open to anyone to attend. Um, there's no uh, prerequisites or, or getting approval or anything like that. You are welcome to study the Word of God in any of the studies that you see listed here. There's also information um, there's, uh, by email to all the different ministries. We have lots of different ministries in this church uh, between children, our youth ministry, our, our uh, uh, we have a, a very active missions, both in the community and internationally. Uh, so we have a lot of different ministry activities, uh, places to serve, uh, and there are emails that can directly con contact you to the ministry heads if there's a ministry that you're interested in or, or you just want information um, or anything like that. You can always do that as well. And then finally, the, the other way to communicate with us is through this little card in the very back that you can tear out. This is the best way to communicate with the church. First of all, if you have prayer request needs, please put them here. We're a praying church. We believe in prayer. We see miracles. And we, uh, um, we use a, a, a church-wide email to, to put prayer requests out. So if you have a prayer request, please put it on, the, on, the, uh, uh, on this little card here. And, send, and, and uh, this is how you can get a prayer request out to the whole church. If it's a private prayer request that you only want our pastor to see, you can put it in the envelope in front of you. And uh, um, this is also if you are interested in becoming a member of our church or if you're interested in more information or anything like that, you can always use this card for that as well. And lastly, there's a little gold bowl in the very back, a plate on that little table back there. That's where you can put these cards because we don't pass an offering plate around, but you can put these cards or you can put your offering uh, or anything else um, you want. <laughs> you can put in that little uh, uh, gold plate on the, uh, in the back on your way out. So it's really good to see everybody. And uh, I want to turn it over to uh, Jen. Uh, who has some um, information about a women's Bible study coming up. Good morning, church. So what's ironic about this is you guys know that I play on the worship team and sing, and some of you know I'm a high school teacher, but this makes me nervous. <laughs> like this part right here is making me nervous. That's right. Um, <laughs> that's right. There will be a pop quiz. Um, <laughs> So I am here to invite the women of the church to join me in a six-week study on disappointment. Um, we're going to work through a study by Lisa Turkhurst on um, like how to, to kind of make our faith real when life doesn't go the way we think it should. Right? God doesn't read my day planner um, all the time, and so most of the time. Um, and so... <laughs> Um, we have a choice to make. We can, we can allow ourselves to um, get angry and bitter, or we can embrace it and see what the Lord's trying to teach us and how the Lord's trying to change us and grow us in him. And so there are books that are needed. Um, we have a couple of sets available. Um, they are Lifeway Publishing Company, but Lifeway is um, currently backordered. But Amazon is good. In fact, the book has been on sale um, through Amazon for the last month. So we're going to meet on Tuesdays at 6 o'clock. Not this coming Tuesday, but a week from Tuesday is when we're going to start. Um, there is a sign-up sheet on the bulletin board in the foyer. So if you would sign up just so that I have your contact information um, and I can get in touch with you and just kind of reach out, make sure that you've got the right materials and that sort of thing. Um, if you have any questions, um, you can reach out to me as well. So with that, let's um, pray, and we'll get started with the rest of the service. Father, we come before you. We just thank you for um, just the grace that you demonstrate in allowing us to walk into your throne room. 
Lord, and that um, you care about each and every person in this room, those watching the live stream, those who hear this message later. Um, Lord, we just lift the service to you. We ask that you would um, use the music to soften our hearts. Lord, prepare our minds and our hearts for the message that you have for us this morning. Lord, we pray for our pastor that um, your words would come from his mouth. Your message would come to our hearts this morning. And um, we just thank you for being a God of grace and being a God of love and being a God of mercy. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please stand as we continue worshiping.
found in Jesus Christ alone. As we open your word again this morning, uh, we're just amazed that the words that we read this morning that were penned 2,000 years ago are just as relevant today as they were when they were first written. That regardless of the things that change in our culture, the attitudes, the direction it goes, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And your word is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That so many things in our world change, and the future is so uncertain, and yet the one thing that we have certainty in is in your love for us and in your son Jesus Christ and what he's done in our lives. And so, Father, this morning, again, as we open your word, we don't want to just come into a building and sit together and walk out unchanged. We want to be continually conformed to the image of your son, Jesus Christ. We struggle in so many ways, and yet we know you have the power to do that work in us that we cannot do ourselves. But you desire within us a willing heart. And so, Father, give us that today, a willing heart to walk in obedience to you to heed your words, to be not just hearers of your word, but to be doers of your word. And so, Father, this morning, grant us your presence and the presence of your spirit to speak to our hearts in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Amen. You may be seated and the children may be dismissed. I want to welcome all of you today. You are the smart ones because you're here at church and you're not sitting on I-95 in traffic. <laughs> we're continuing our study today, and some of the people at home are going, we're the really smart ones because we're still at home, you know, <laughs> sipping our coffee and wearing our bunny slippers. But, but we are in James chapter 4 this morning. We're going to be looking at verses 13 through 17. James writes and he says, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, If the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance, and all such boasting is evil. Therefore, to the one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. John Brandrick of Cornwall, England, was 62 years old when he was given the diagnosis by his doctor, pancreatic cancer with a life expectancy of six months or less. With those words, Brandrick decided that he was going to go out in style. He quit his job, he stopped paying his mortgage, he ignored the bills that came in the mail. He emptied his bank account, spending everything on lavish dinners at the finest restaurants, expensive entertainment, and world travel. He gave away most of his clothes to a local thrift store with the exception of one suit that he planned on using when he was buried. He told his lawyer that he wanted his funeral, what he wanted for his funeral, and he told his lawyer to plan it because he did not want his family to have the emotional grief of doing it. Much like that movie, The Bucket List, those of you who are familiar with it, it was a movie starring Morgan Freeman and, and Jack Nicholson. Brandrick spared no expense to enjoy life before he died. It appeared that John Brandrick had thought of everything in preparing for his death. There was one thing Brandrick had not planned on as he enjoyed this lavish lifestyle. His health, ironically, was not deteriorating as he had thought it would. When he returned to his doctor's office six months after his extravagant life, a subsequent scan revealed something very interesting. He didn't have cancer at all. The first diagnosis by the doctor was misdiagnosed. Now, you know, I think about that and I wonder, how would you feel about that? Woo-hoo, woo, -hoo, woo -hoo. you know what I mean, you know? <laughs> While Brandrick was relieved that he did not have the cancer, the wrong diagnosis left him in financial ruin. You know, making presumptions about the future can be very dangerous because we never know what the future holds. And sort of that's the message that James is giving us today in this passage. There are those who think that we can control our own future, that we determine our own destiny. In fact, William Ernest Henley, he penned a famous poem known it called Invictus. Invictus is Latin for unconquered. And in his poem, a very famous line many of you may have heard before. He says, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. It's interesting to know the background behind that point. Because Henley had suffered for many, many years with tuberculosis. A tuberculosis infection would, which wound up costing him one of his legs. One of his legs had to be amputated. And after that, that's when he penned this poem. Now, it's also interesting to know that on June, uh, June 11, 2001, Timothy McVeigh, the Oklahoma City bomber, chose this line from Henley's poem as his final statement before he went to get, receive lethal injection. So that brings up a question. Do we control our future? Are we the master of our fate? Are we the captain of our soul? 
And while the choices we make do impact our future, ultimately, God is in control of all things. You know, there's an interesting joke that is told among Orthodox Jews. The question, how do you make the Almighty laugh? And the answer is, tell him your plans. <laughs> you know, the scripture says, the mind of a man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Proverbs says a person's steps are directed by the Lord. How then can anyone understand their own way? King David, I love what King David said. Psalm 31, he said, I trust in you, Lord. You are my God. My times are in your hands. How true. You know, it appears from these scriptures and from many others that we can make plans for our future. But God's always the one who has the final say in everything. It's funny that this message would come today as soon as you're starting this, this Bible study on disappointment. Because what is disappointment? Disappointment is usually because what we planned, what we expected, what we hoped for didn't turn out the way that we thought it would. Now, let me ask you a question, though. If God's ultimately in control, does this mean that we should never make any plans for the future? Does that mean that we should just you know, forget about our calendar on our iPhone and, and just live one day at a time? Should we just you know, forget about our retirement accounts and our 401k plans? Of course not. The scripture actually says that those who prepare for the future are those who are wise, those who are prudent. In fact, in Proverbs, Solomon says, go to the ant, you sluggard. I love how he says that. You know, I mean, you know, sluggard. Go to the ant, O oh sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief officer or ruler, she prepares her bread in summer and gathers her food in the harvest. You know, I love that passage because it's just another one of those passages where we're commanded to go back to look at nature and to learn from something that God has created. Remember when Jesus said, consider the birds of the air. Have you ever gone out and done that? Ever just watch the birds of the air? He says they neither toil nor spin, and you know, yet and, you know, God takes care of their every need. You know, you look at birds, I've never seen a bird worried about their next meal. I've never seen a bird worried about how they're going to pay the mortgage on their nest. You know, they're just satisfied with life. And so you go out and you look at an ant, and you watch ants in the summertime, and what do you see? You never see an ant sitting next to the, the, the nest, I mean, next to the mound going, I think I'll just take another smoke break. You know, I just, you know, I, I got to finish my iced tea before I get to work, back to work, boss. You know what I mean? They're always busy doing things. Why? They're always getting ready. They're always moving around. Even in the heat of the summer, as hot as it can be, the ants are always busy working. Now, why is that? Because they know that there's a point when they can't work, when the winter time is going to come. So if they don't work now, they won't have food when they can't work. What does that tell us? They are preparing for the future. Proverbs says the prudent man sees evil and hides himself, but the naive go on and they're punished for it. In other words, a wise person looks to the future, looks ahead, looks around, sees what's going on in life, and realizes, okay, wait a minute, this doesn't look good. I need to prepare for the future. I need to plan for the future. In contrast, the naive, they don't give any consideration for what goes on past today. And if, they ultimately pay the consequence of that. You know, you find even in the scriptures, God warned people so they could pre prepare for the future. In Genesis, God used Joseph to warn Pharaoh in a dream of a devastating event that was going to take place in the future. Remember, Pharaoh has these two dreams. He has this dream about these corn stalks that wither and die, and then these, these very skinny, these gaunt cows. And none of his wise men, none of his counselors can tell Pharaoh what these dreams mean. And then one of the people says, well, you know, I, there was a guy in prison. There, there's this Jewish guy in prison, Joseph. And one time he told me my dream, and it came true. And so Pharaoh says, bring him in. And so they bring Joseph in. And Joseph says, your dreams are one and the same. And they're talking about a famine that is coming ahead. And you had the dream twice because it's urgent matter. It's going to happen soon. And Pharaoh says, well, I don't know what to do about this. He says, I'll tell you what. You interpreted the dream. You know what to do about this. You prepare you see, God gave Pharaoh dreams to prepare for the future, but he had to act on them. If God's issued warnings about the future in the scriptures, obviously God wants us to be prepared for our future as well. <clears throat> the scripture never reproves a person for preparing for the future. 
James is simply warning us about the importance of including God in those plans. Making sure that we just don't make our own plans and go about our way, but we have to consider God in all things. Now, there are three areas in our life, three sins that can prevent us from planning properly. And we see those in this passage. First of all, there's the sin of presumption. Presuming upon God's will for us. Well, this is just what I'm going to do. And God's left out the entire equation. The second is boasting. Boasting about what we're doing in our own strength and what we are going to do. And the third one is a sin of omission. Knowing what we should do, but then ignoring it and not doing it. And so that's what we're going to look at this morning. James says, come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Now, to understand what James is saying here, I want to put this back a little bit into a cultural context when he wrote this. The Jews were great at business trade in the ancient world. In fact, many of them are still good at it today. But when you look at the ancient world of the Jews, you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all very wealthy men. And God had no problem with that. God blessed them. He prospered them. So there was no problem with that. But they were very good at their business. In fact, the Jews were so good at business, when Nehemiah returned after the captivity to rebuild the wall around Jerusalem, to restore the city of Jerusalem, one of the problems they had was all the surrounding nations wanted to come there, even on the Sabbath, and do business with them. Because they were, it was profitable to trade with them. And finally, Nehemiah had to say, you can come all the other days, you cannot come on the Sabbath. That is our day that's reserved for God. In the New Testament, later on, we read in the book of Acts about a woman named Lydia. She is a seller of purple. Now, that doesn't mean much to us today, but let me tell, explain something about that. She would have been sort of like a diamond dealer today because a seller of purple, there was a little teeny shell, a little um, mollusk, you might call it, um, in the Mediterranean Sea. And basically, they would have to break that open, and it would bleed out a purple dye. And you'd get about one drop out of each one of them. So it was very tedious work to make this dye. But the dye was very important because it made the royalty wore robes used with this dye because any other type of dye, when it was exposed to sunlight over a long period of time, would fade. But this would not fade in the sunlight. So all the royalty wore purple. And they wore this purple because it was a very expensive garment. And Lydia, we find in the book of Acts, was basically a seller of purple. She was a dealer. She dealt all over the area of Asia Minor. She was very well known and, and a trader. And she, um, trading, not trader like trader, but, you know, trading with people. And she supported Paul's ministry. So in many ways, <clears throat> the world gave every opportunity to the Jews uh, to basically trade with them because it was to their advantage because they brought a lot of trade into their country. They brought a lot of businesses into their country. And so when new cities were being established in the ancient world, the Jews were often invited to be a part of those communities because they would bring the trade there and they would make the city prosper. James gives this hypothetical situation, which is of this man who's going to go to one of these cities He's going to go there, he's going to trade for a year, he's going to make a profit, and then he's just going to come back home, and he's just going to enjoy the profits that he made from it. Now, let me say this. Years ago, I was friends with a gentleman who did something very similar to that. Here in the Fredericksburg area, he would go into a shopping center, he would rent a space in the shopping center, one of the units, and he established a pizza restaurant. And he would take it, he would build that business up for a year or two. He had a phenomenally... He had great pizzas. I mean, you know, he had really good food. And he would build that business up for a year or two. He would make it very successful. Then he would sell the business. And then he'd go down five, ten miles down the road, and he'd start another pizza place. And he'd build that business up. And then he sold it. And he went over, and then he went to another place. And the last restaurant, he just retired a couple, about a year or two ago. The last restaurant he had was out in King George. But he just, you know, bold, um, built up a business, sold it, built up a business, sold it, and just kept doing this and all. Now, that pretty much well worked for him. It worked for, for him. But while I think he succeeded in that, for most people, those types of plans don't work out well. And why do I say that? When you look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics and you look at their, the, the rates of failure rates of businesses, 18.4% of all private sector businesses fail in the first year. When you go to the fifth year, 49.7% of all private businesses fail within five years. And if you go 10 years out, 
65.9% of all businesses fail. So when you think about that, if you go into a business on your own, you have a two out of three chance that your business is gonna fail within 10 years. You know, we make these plans for the future. You know, we can't assume that we're gonna go into some business for a year and, and make a profit. Last week I mentioned something interesting. Um, we were talking about Lucifer and in, in Isaiah, he has the five I wills. I will do this and I will send to heaven and I will do these things and I will do these things. And it was all his boastful pride that brought him down. When you look at this passage, guess what you find in the statement of this businessman? Five I wills, five I wills. First, he presumes upon the time he will do it. To, today or tomorrow, we will do this. Secondly, he presumes upon the location. We will go to such and such a city. Third, he presumes upon the duration of the time. We're going to spend a year there. Fourth, he presumes upon what he will do to make money. We will engage in this business. And then fifth, he presumes upon the, the outcome of the business. We will make a profit. Do you hear that in this businessman's this, his, his mentality? I will do this, I will do that, I will do that. He's presuming upon the future. And again, it's important to understand, James is not attacking the idea of having a personal business. He's not attacking the consideration of anybody who wants to make a profit in a business. What he is saying here, what he's pointing out to us is that whenever it's done with no consideration for God, what God wants us to do, when we're preparing our future without any plan or any consideration of what God wants us to do, then we're in the wrong. We're not doing it the way God wants us to do it. God's left out of the equation. Now, James gives us two reasons here. Why presuming upon the future, apart from God, is foolish. First of all, he says, yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You know, none of us know what the future holds. Or for that matter, what will even happen tomorrow. None of us could have predicted what would have happened in early 2020 when the pandemic hit. It was unlike anything else we have ever experienced in this life. Today, when you think about it, none of our lives are the same as a result of that. Our lives have changed. In Disaster Relief, when I do the training, it's what we call, in psychological terms, a new normal. When you go through a devastating event in your life, your life has changed forever. It will never be the same as it was before that event, and so you have to adapt to what's called a new normal. All of us have been forced to make adjustments, whether we liked it or not. Because of what? Because our lives changed due to the unexpected. We don't know what life will be like next year. We don't know what it will be like next month. We don't even know what it will be like tomorrow. And I'm not being melodramatic there. As a pastor and as a chaplain, I've seen a person's life change drastically in less than 24 hours. Because a person's entire possessions were ruined by a hurricane because a person's house was totally leveled by a tornado or because some tragedy took the life of a person's loved one and their life was changed forever. There's a second reason why it's foolish to keep God out of the equation. We don't presume upon the future because as um, our earthly life is like, as James says here, a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. You know, this life is transitory, as transitory as the steam on the cup of your coffee in the morning, or as transitory as your breath on a winter day when you breathe it out and you see it and then the second later it's gone. Have you ever noticed that as you get older how quick, quickly time goes by? Everybody said, yeah, they're the old people. Okay, no, no. No, but I mean, really, seriously, you know, you, you, you look back on things and you don't realize just life seems like the quicker, the older you get, the quicker it moves by. Last year, we celebrated my granddaughter's seventh, or this year, we celebrated our granddaughter's seventh birthday. And we had this little party for her all, and she goes, Papa, this is the best birthday party ever. 
And I didn't want to bust her bubble, but I was like, Haley, you've only had six other ones and four of those you don't even remember. <laughs> but I'm glad you like it. And no, I didn't bust her bubble. But you know, we can look back at some event in life, and I've done this recently. You look back at something and you think, well, when was that? Oh, that's about five years ago, six, seven years ago and all. And you don't realize how long ago it was. I'll give you a case in point. Do you realize that Star Wars, the movie, came out 45 years ago? Man, Jen was barely graduating college by then. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Don't look at me like that. I was just, it was just a joke. Okay. <laughs> Glad I pickled somebody here. But you know, you look at stuff and you go, you know, I asked my wife the other day, I said, when did that movie come out? Was that like four or five years ago? She goes, no, it came out in 2002. They're talking about some other movie, right? And I'm like, what? 20 years ago? I mean, you know, you look at it and just life goes by. You know, in fact, it's interesting that Job, as he's going through this painful time, he says, my days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle. And you know, five or six times in the book of Job, and I'm not going to go through all the verses, they're in your note sheet, but five or six times, Job talks about how quickly life goes by. David in Psalm 144 said, man is a mere breath, his days are like a passing shadow. So you know what? Life is going to fly by. We can't leave God out of the equation. Secondly, we need to guard against the sin of boasting. James says, but as it is, you boast in your arrogance, all such boasting is evil. You know, presuming upon the future is living with an attitude that God doesn't exist and we are in complete control of our future. But boasting is a little different. The one who boasts about the future may acknowledge the existence of God, but they credit their success with themselves with no regard for God. You know, I did this. I did that. I did this. You know, what was it? Frank Sinatra that sang that song. I did it my way. That's sort of the attitude of boasting. When we presume upon the future, it's not long before we begin to boast about what we've done. In fact, Jesus told the parable of the rich fuel, fool, the rich fool, to warn against such types of boasting. The rich man, he, he had this huge farmland, and he had a bumper crop one year, and he said, what am I going to do with my entire crop? I don't even have a place to store it. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll tear down all those barns. I'll build bigger barns. I'll put all my stuff in there, and I'll have so much abundance that I can sell off for so many years, I'm just going to retire. And that's what he says to himself. He says, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. But what does God say to him in that parable? He says, you fool. This very night, your soul is required of you. And now, who will own what you've prepared? That's a very sobering thought. Every single one of us to drive out this driveway and be in eternity before tomorrow. Working with the county, volunteering with the county as an EMT, more than once I've seen people that stepped into eternity when they weren't expecting it. James says all such boasting about the future is evil. James uses a very interesting word there. Well, first of all, he says, let me get back up a minute, because he says, you know, these people, type of people boast in their arrogance. And, and the word boast there means to be loud-mouthed or to speak loudly. And it's not necessarily a negative term, because sometimes it's used of joyful shouting of praise to God. So it can be a positive term. But in the context in which James is using, it's speaking about a person who's touting their accomplishments. Look what I did here. Look what I did here. And they're sort of loud-mouthed about it. And then he uses this Greek word for arrogance, and it comes from a word that's interesting. It means to wander about. And actually, the origin behind that Greek word is it spoke of like these, these traveling medicine men, these people who would go wander from city to city and make great promises about what they could do and what cures they could um, affect with their medicines and stuff like that. And so basically, in the context James uses here, he's describing someone who boasts about things that they cannot control, things that, over which they have no control. And then he says, all such boasting is evil. And again, here's an interesting thing, because he uses a Greek word, poneros. Poneros is actually a word that Jesus used, a name that Jesus used for Satan. 
And that's not surprising because it's Satan's boasting as an angel that got him, to, that caused him to be a fallen angel. Now, in planning for the future, we have to be aware about boasting about it because we don't know what a day is going to bring forth. And then he brings us to the third one, the sin of omission. Therefore, to the one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. The sin of the presumptuous person is acting as if God doesn't exist and making plans apart from totally, completely apart from God. The, the sin of a boastful person is acknowledging God's existence but taking personal credit for everything that they do. You know, God didn't have any part of it, I did it. The sin of omission speaks of the person who acknowledges God, affirms what God says is true, but then doesn't do it. James makes a very important point here. Please don't miss it. Those who know God's plan for them are responsible to obey it. If God has spoken to your life, spoken into your life about something that you are to do, you need to do it. Now, it may be a career. It may be simple, as simple as I want you to go to that person and share your faith. I want you to go to that person and ask forgiveness. I want you to go to that person and do this or do that. But when we know the right thing to do and we don't do it, Scripture defines that as being sin. Jesus told a very interesting parable, the parable of the faithful steward. And he speaks of this man who, who has a lot of servants, and he says, all right, I'm going away for a while, and I want you to take care of business while I'm gone. And so one of the head servants sees that the master's going to be gone for a while, probably a month. A lot of times they would travel by the, um, the, the full moon and then travel back by the full moon. And so he sees he's going to be gone, so he begins to beat the other slaves, the, beat the other servants, misuse them, and then basically goes out and starts getting drunk. He's just thinking, well, the you know, master's not coming back anytime soon. I can do what I want to. And Jesus says, that servant who knew his master's will but did not get ready or act according to his will will suffer a severe beating. Now, I'm not saying that as a believer, if you don't do God's will, he's going to beat you up. But what I am saying is you will suffer consequences for not doing God's will. It may be a lost opportunity. It may be something in eternity where you regret that you didn't do something, that, where you could have led somebody to the Lord, or you could have had that opportunity to, to minister to somebody. There are consequences for not doing what we know we're supposed to be doing. Jonah's another example. He was one who knew the right thing to do, and he didn't do it. God says, I want you to get up, and I want you to go to Nineveh. He got half of it right. He got up, and he went. He just went in the wrong direction, you know? So half obedience is not full obedience. It's not good, you know? So he gets up, and he heads in the opposite direction. And, you know, God, I mean, I, you know, you got to give God credit. I mean, he, I love his theatrics. You know what I mean? you got this huge fish that, you know, the whole ship is getting destroyed, all because Jonah's in the bottom of the ship sleeping. You know, the, a guy who had no conscience. He's running from God. He's in the bottom of the ship. It's not like, oh, I can't sleep. I know I'm really doing wrong. He's out there snoozing. You know, he's snoring down there, and the ship, they're all trying to save the ship, and they go down there, and they wake him up. You need to get up here and all that. And he goes, hey, boys, it's because of me like that. No, 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 no. And they're trying to throw the cargo off. They're trying to do everything they can other than throw him overboard, which he told them to do. Finally, they go, okay, this isn't working. And they heave-ho him, right? Now, can you imagine the, the this is like men from all of these other countries. They throw him overboard in the storm. This fish comes up, eats him, and takes him back down, and then all of a sudden everything becomes calm. Who would you worship? I mean, I'll tell you what. That's better than any track I've ever handed out. <laughs> Man. God had to get Jonah's attention, and he did it. So this brings up the final thing as we close. So what's the balance for our lives? How do we plan for the future and do it according to God's will? James gives us the answer right here to this passage. I skipped right over for a minute, but James, let's go back to verse 15. James says, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. In everything that we do, we should acknowledge God and his guidance in our lives. We should acknowledge his plans for our lives. And this begins with prayer before we take any action whatsoever. Remember what James told us in chapter 1. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let that man ask, not doubting, 
But I ask with faith, not doubting, for not that man expect that he'll receive anything from the Lord. So when you go to God, you ask him for wisdom, you seek it from him, you know he wants to give it to you, but you don't do it in such a way where you go, well, I'm going to ask God for wisdom, but I don't really know if he's going to give it to me or not. Wisdom is really only a prayer away. But we have to ask with that attitude of faith, trusting that God will provide the answer for us. Now, it may not always be the answer we want, but he will give us an answer. But if we fail to pray first, we make ourselves susceptible to presuming upon the future and eventually boasting about that future. Have you ever heard the, the saying, you know, ready, aim, fire? When you don't pray, it's ready, fire, aim. You know, you go back and you go, oh, wait a minute, I forgot to aim. And that often causes heartache because we have to undo or try to undo the things that we've done. In praying, we test everything that we receive in prayer against the word of God. Because sometimes we have an inclination of where we want that prayer to go. But we have to test it against the word of God. Does what we believe God is speaking to our hearts line up with the word of God? Because the Holy Spirit will never contradict in prayer what he tells us in his word. Before we go to communion, I want to leave you with one last thought. Earlier, I mentioned the movie The Bucket List. The story, if you're not familiar with it, is about two cancer patients in a hospital. One of them is actually the owner of the hospital. The other, and they're assigned to a room together, is an auto mechanic. So you have one man who is extremely wealthy, one man who is a common laborer, but they have one thing in common. They both have a terminal illness. And they get into this conversation about life. And the one man, played by Morgan Freeman, Carter Chambers, he's writing out a list. And Jack Nicholson says to him, he says, you know, what, what are you writing out? He goes, well, it's a bucket list. Well, what's a bucket list? He says, well, it's all the things I want to do before I die. It's interesting because in the beginning of the movie, Carter Chambers says something very interesting. And I quote this. He says, there was a survey once. A thousand people were asked if they could know in advance would they want to know the exact day of their death. Ninety-six percent of them said no. I always kind of leaned towards the other four percent. I thought it would be liberating knowing how much time you had left to work with. It turns out it's not. I find that interesting. Moses, as far as I can tell, is the only person in the Bible who knew when he was going to die. Why do I say that? When Israel was promised to go to the, or was, was allowed to go into the promised land, when they were permitted to enter and they did not enter, God said, all right, you're not going to enter, then you're not getting in. You didn't want to go in because you were afraid of those people. You called me a liar, and so you will die in the wilderness. Forty years from now, this entire generation will be wiped out. Moses knew pretty much to the year when he was going to die. And why I say that's interesting is because Moses only wrote one psalm of all the 150 psalms, Psalm 90. And here's what he says in that psalm. Teach us to number our days that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. Think about that. We usually measure our life in years. Well, I'm so many years old. I'm so many years old. I'm so many years old. But in reality, we live life one day at a time. Some of us, or none of us, I should say, will know how long we live. Like David said, our times are in your hands, not ours. But, you know, may we be able to pray like Moses prayed because he said, teach us to number our days. But then he says, so that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. There was a reason why he wanted to know the number of his days, so that he could use them to the very best of his ability to serve God, to walk with God. You see, the children of Israel disobeyed God, and as you walk track through that, you'll find that they continually rebelled against God. They complained about God. They found fault with God. They found fault with his leadership. It was constant grumbling and complaining throughout those 40 years. And here's what Moses says about those people. He says, for all of our days 
have dwindled away in your fury. We have finished our years like a sigh. Think about that. At the end of their life, they're going, I don't think any of us want to find ourselves finishing our years like a sigh. It's my hope that we live lives that are free of the presumption of the future, that are free about boasting about the things that we've done in life and our accomplishments, and that are free from admitting or neglecting anything that God has called us to do. And I leave you with that challenge today. What has God called you to do? Are you doing it? How are you impacting the kingdom of God? Are you going to make a change in this world? Or are you going to end your life with a sigh? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word this morning. And Father, we know that this earthly life is like a vapor. It's like a breath. And it will quickly pass, quicker than we expect. In your grace, you have made yourself known to us through your son, Jesus Christ. You have given us your word that we might know you better. And you have given us the privilege of approaching your throne of grace with confidence through prayer. Father, how many times are we remiss in those times of prayer when that is the, one of the greatest privileges we have in life? It's not an obligation, it's a privilege. Help us to live lives that are pleasing to you. Lives that don't end in a sigh, but rejoice over what you are willing to do through us when we are obedient to you. And Father, I pray that you speak to every heart today, every heart that is seated here in the sanctuary, every heart that is listening to this message on our live stream, every heart that listens to this on our YouTube channel later, everyone who hears this voice today, that, that we will look at what we are doing in our lives and how we are investing our time so that we do not end our lives in a sigh. We ask these things in the precious name of your Son, Jesus Christ, as we come to the table to fellowship with him today in communion. Amen. Christ gathered the closest men to him, the men that he had walked with for over three years. They had ministered together, they had heard his messages, they had seen his example. And he gathered them together to commission them, in a sense, to the work of the ministry. He gathered them together that night and he said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the In the same way, he took a cup and said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the cup. Father, as we go forth from here today, we pray that you give us a greater sense of purpose for your kingdom. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Please stand as we close in song.
you hold our hearts together, there's no one.